You sit next to me, Mickey. <laughs> They made us alphabetical. Alpha no, 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 it's alphabetical. <laughs> Correct side. This is, this is the, well, I'm usually on the left, actually. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I, I want to reach out. I've got my students out here. Uh, this is really bad deal. Stack the house, huh? Everyone's got their dough, so you got it all in your head, so do I. I just do this out of nervousness. <laughs> you've got to be plugged in. That's been his biggest problem all his life. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> no, no, come on, King. You won't know anything you say. I know, I know. <laughs> no, 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 I know, I mean right now. Oh, I know. <laughs> okay. I know. <laughs> Why am I protecting you? <laughs> Did you cover campaign finance for journals? Um, well, actually, uh, you started covering it for Associated Press. That's right. Yeah, right. Off and on. Yeah. 1972, one. Wow. Not continuously. Welcome to the uh, ARCO Forum of the John F. Kennedy School of Government at Harvard University. Uh, tonight's forum is called Money in Politics, Is Reform Possible? It's co-sponsored by the uh, American Prospect and by the Institute of Politics. Uh, my name is Bob Kuttner, co-editor of the American Prospect, and we have a really uh, stellar lineup tonight. Let me go from uh, your left, uh, Joan Claybrook, uh, President of Public Citizen, Mickey Edwards, a uh, former uh, eight-term Republican congressman from Oklahoma, now lecturer at the Kennedy School. Brooks Jackson, uh, award-winning correspondent uh, of CNN, formerly uh, of the Wall Street Journal, uh, expert in campaign finance and campaign finance reform. David Magleby, professor of political science at Brigham Young University. Uh, Alan Miller, 
Director of the Center for Responsive Politics, uh, Trevor Potter, Chairman of the Federal uh, Elections Commission, Michael Waldman, Special Assistant to President Clinton in charge of campaign finance reform, and um, Fred Wertheimer, uh, the President of Common Cause. And I think it's fair to say that between uh, uh, Joan and Ellen and Fred, uh, we probably have uh, the three most influential people with maybe uh, 50 years experience among them on behalf of campaign finance reform. This is a big panel, so we'll try and go through this briskly and uh, not quite do sound bites, but do quick comments and then get to audience participation. Um, we are also uh, live on C-SPAN tonight and uh, audience who ask questions should please come to the microphone. Uh, let me begin by asking uh, Joan Claybrook what is the problem that campaign finance reform is supposedly a solution to? Well, I think the first problem is legislative. That is that um, the decisions made in Congress are overly influenced by the money that members receive in their election campaigns. And that also uh, raises the question of who gets elected and whether or not incumbents stay in office forever and challengers just don't have the resources to be competitive. Um, Brooks, is this primarily a problem of who gets elected and who they are beholden to after they're elected, or is it more a problem of uh, how legislative politics works in Congress, or is it both? Well, in my view, the, the most serious problem is, is neither of those, although, although those are both problems. The most serious problem is uh, the lack of confidence that the American electorate has in its own government. Over a period of 20 years or so, the, uh, the polling shows that uh, an electorate that once believed that we had a government that was truly run mostly for the people and not primarily for special interests now has reversed its view. And somewhere between three quarters and, uh, and uh, two thirds of the American public believes that the federal government is run most primarily for the benefit of special interests. Whether, whether they're right or wrong, that's what they believe. And democracy, I believe, is a fragile thing and cannot long uh, survive in a healthy state with that kind of attitude. So do you think this is a perception problem or a reality problem? I think it's based in reality. Personally, uh, I think the public thinks it's worse than it is. My view is it's pretty bad. <laughs> uh, I have been surprised that a lot of political scientists view, that, view this as a kind of symmetrical evil, that there's too much special interest money in the system, that uh, there's too much uh, business money, but the business money is offset by labor money, and that the problem is special interest money generally. Uh, a, a different view would hold it that uh, special interest money pays uh, Republicans to behave like Republicans and pays Democrats to behave like Republicans. Uh, Michael Waldman, do you think this is a, a symmetrical problem, or is it a, a good government problem, or is it a not so symmetrical problem? Well, it's really, it's an element of both. Uh, from the perspective of the Clinton administration, it's clearly the case uh, that when you have a, lo a lot of uh, narrow organized interests who are able to dominate the process, that even a Democratic Congress has a difficult time producing something like health care uh, or some of these other issues, such as uh, the crime bill, where uh, the NRA was able to wield a disproportionate impact. We think it's, a, it, it's something that we care about as Democrats, but it's also the case that uh, public confidence in government has continued to be uh, as low as it is now if people think that narrow interests are able to overwhelm the national interest. So it's both. Uh, David Magleby, you defend your profession. How do political scientists conceive of this? Well, we're not, we're not unified in our view. I think, though, Bob, the big problem is the field is not uh, fair for the challengers. They face a big uphill battle in becoming just barely visible. We have largely invisible challengers, grossly underfunded, both parties. The problem has been a larger problem for Republican challengers. And so the lack of competition, especially in the House, I think is one of the major reasons we need campaign finance reform. Uh, how do you see it as a, as a Republican from the point of view of, uh, of Republican challengers, Mickey? Well, I, I think Dave is right. Uh, Republican challengers have had a hard time uh, competing for money. But, you know, the problem, Bob, is I, th I think I would challenge some of the uh, basic assumptions. I, you know, I, I don't think the problem uh, is the influx of money into the system. I think the influx of money perhaps from some special interests, big money sources, uh, is a problem but not money itself. In fact, it's what I worry about 
uh, is that some of the solutions that have been proposed, limiting the amount of money put into the system, for example, actually reduce participation, make it harder for candidates to get their views out to the voters. Uh, so I, mean, I think the problem is, number one, we don't have enough participation in the system, and, and you know, having even less is, is bad. Uh, and number two, we need to do something about making sure that we increase the amount of participation by individuals, not special interests, through tax credits uh, like they have in Canada or things like that. You know, it sometimes sounds like the problem is simultaneously too much money and not enough money. Is Fred Wertheimer, can you sort that out for us? Well, it is. Um, uh, there's too much special interest money, uh, which does undermine public confidence, which is a central part of this problem. And there's too little money going to challengers of both parties. Uh, uh, the fact of the matter is when you try to figure out uh, what goes on with campaign finance reform legislation and why does it have problems, there are various reasons that people will point to. But the bottom line reason is incumbents of both parties have a sweetheart deal. They have enormous financial advantages and any serious reform is going to require them to vote for change that will take away some of their advantages. And part of that advantage is they do have uh, all the money they need and their challengers as a group do not have uh, access to the resources they need to compete. Ellen Miller, how, how does a political democracy that is also a market economy reconcile the principle of uh, one person, one vote with the campaign finance operating principle of one dollar, one vote? Well, it's pretty difficult, and I would say that that is exactly what the political system has come down to. Um, in fact, there are really two kinds of campaigns going on. The very first one is a campaign for money. It's a, the candidate who raises the most money most often wins a race. Um, people without money don't participate in this system. The wealthy contribute disproportionately to political campaigns. There is a fundamental disconnect here, and so I would say that this is an issue having to do with electoral democracy rather than one that just deals with clean government. It's a, um, it's a much more fundamental and systemic problem. And what is the cost of that? In other words, if, if candidates to become viable have to raise money either from wealthy individuals or from special interests, uh, what are the various costs of that system to political democracy itself? Well, it, it's the, the issue of equality and fairness and equal opportunity in the political system. Does everyone have access, either as candidates or as voters, or as pleaders in terms of making public policy to the system? I think the answer is pretty clearly no. Uh, right now we have a system that's dominated by wealthy individual contributors, uh, either as large individual contributors or PACs, or self-financed candidates. And I think the system is skewing out of control. Some have actually called it a plutocracy. Uh, let me ask uh, Trevor Potter. Uh, a lot of people who were critical of the proposed reforms argued that the Federal Elections Commission barely is able to keep pace with the present system of controls. If you increase the system of controls, you're going to create a bureaucratic nightmare. Uh, would your agency be able to cope with a reformed uh, campaign finance regime? I think that's a fair problem. Uh, we exist to enforce the laws passed by Congress. Uh, we have not had the resources necessary really for the last 20 years since the commission was created to do that, I think, the way that the Commission would like to. Uh, disclosure is not as complete as it should be. Uh, the auditors to look at campaign spending and make certain that it has been properly reported. Uh, lawyers to examine uh, potential illegal acts. We don't have the resources that we'd like to have to do that. So when you then look at the possibility of a new and more complicated law, uh, I think that causes some concern unless it brings with it a commitment to give the commission the resources necessary to enforce it. Well, we came very close to getting a campaign finance uh, law, reform law through this time. Uh, it got caught in the end of the session logjam along with a lot of other uh, worthy legislation. Uh, there are a lot of different theories on why it went down the drain. Uh, Fred, what, uh, what happened from your point of view? Well, first of all, similar legislation passed in 1992 vetoed uh, by President Bush. President Clinton comes in on record for this as a priority, prepared to sign the legislation. The bill passes the Senate by 60 to 38 in 1993, passes the House 
by 255 to 175 in 1993. So how do you wind up out of that with no legislation? One, um, the, this bill would have seriously taken away advantages of incumbents. So incumbents were very nervous about this bill. Two, uh, there was just a missed opportunity. Uh, you have to move very quickly with this kind of legislation before it gets caught up in election year politics and election year fundraising. Uh, the, uh, uh, the legislation, if it had moved earlier in 1993, I believe the chances are excellent it would have passed. But it did get delayed. Uh, and those delays played into the ability for uh, Senate Republicans to kill it with a filibuster. Uh, and the third issue here uh, is uh, the cynicism that exists in the country today, some of it with good cause in terms of the way people perceive Washington and the way they're being governed uh, and whether they're being represented, plays into the argument that no solutions can work. So that even when you have, and I would argue, that this was a serious solution that represented very basic change in a number of areas. It's very easy to attack it, uh, attack it as taxpayer financing even when there was no taxpayer funding. Uh, so I think the cynicism and some demagoguery, in my view, also contributed to its defeat. John, this was a, a rather delicately balanced series of compromises between uh, not only Republicans and Democrats, but between House and Senate, between House Democrats and Senate Democrats, uh, what were the key elements in, in the bill? And from your point of view, was it a defensible compromise? I think it was a very defensible compromise. Uh, the structure of the bill was to limit expenditures and to uh, provide a small amount of public funding, one third of the limit in the House and in the Senate uh, low cost TV. And the, the program is voluntary. I mean, the objection to it, it seemed to me, was false because you could either opt to participate and uh, agree to a limit and uh, agree to uh, receive the, the public benefit, or you could opt out and you didn't have to participate. What would happen if you would opt out? If you opted out, then uh, you didn't have to abide by the limit and you could raise all your money privately. Um, you couldn't do it uh, without some consequence, and the consequence was that the uh, participating candidate would get um, uh, funds to supplement them if you exceeded the limit by a certain amount. So you couldn't go hog wild without your uh, opponent getting some compensating funds, and also it took care of a lot of other problems. It dealt with money that is called soft money, that is, um, ex uh, evades the limits in the current law, and um, it uh, is, is given through political parties, and it can be given in $100,000 pops, and uh, this has become a real problem. It would take care of that. Uh, it put limits on bundling, not everything that we wanted, but... What's, uh, what's bundling? Bundling is where um, rich individuals like all gather together, and they, they bundle their money, uh, and they usually do it either in a corporate setting so that, you know, a corporation is handing over $100,000 to a candidate, each $1,000 with uh, each uh, uh, contributor, and so uh, they would put limits on doing that, which uh, evades some of the rules. And um, it would uh, abolish a, a, a kind of a PAC, a political action committee that House members particularly have used, uh, which are called leadership PACs or member PACs, which also evade uh, many of the rules. And uh, they, the money is used to help other candidates in the Congress. So it had a lot of reforms in it. And they were very significant reforms. And I think that the reason that it went down uh, is that um, the Democrats were afraid of it, and they delayed and delayed and delayed making a final decision, particularly the Democrats in the House. And there was never a real confrontation. And if this bill had come up in even March of 1994, the Senate Republicans had filibustered it, and George Mitchell said, this bill's on the floor until we get it through, and there'd been this major contretemps, you know that the press would have covered it, the president would have gotten more involved, um, the public at large would have known that it even existed, which many of them didn't even know existed, and it would have been a major battle. And when those major kind of battles occur, then the public really has something to say about it. In this case, it was an all behind the scenes, and the public really ne never had a, choice, a chance to jump in. Uh, Michael, the president has been criticized for not making campaign mm -hmm. finance reform a, a higher priority. Uh, there were some unfriendly editorials by uh, newspapers of record that were initially very friendly to the reform arguing that if he had made this as high a priority as he had made some, uh, some of the other issues, uh, gotten it on the uh, agenda earlier in the year, 
uh, it might not have gotten caught in the log jam. Is that fair? I actually don't think it's fair. Uh, the facts are this. President Clinton strongly supports campaign reform, strongly supported this bill, felt it was very real reform, as well as lobby reform and a number of other elements of political reform, uh, pushed it onto the agenda, consistently pushed the members of Congress and the congressional leadership to act on this, uh, would have eagerly signed it, and uh, spoke out for it when it was uh, at the appropriate moment in the legislative process to make a difference. Uh, the fact of the matter is, it's true, there were a number of other high profile issues uh, that also took up the president's time. One thing we've occasionally been criticized for, even by the same editorials that on Tuesday attacked us for not making campaign reform the uh, highest priority, on Thursday they would say we haven't prioritized. The president worked on the budget, he worked on health care and crime and trade, and those are not things uh, of minor import. So uh, nobody on Capitol Hill uh, had any illusions that President Clinton was strongly supporting this legislation, and uh, we're very disappointed that it didn't pass, but we're going to come back at it next year. Uh, Ellen Miller, this was, this was half a loaf. This was partial public financing, partial limits on PACs, partial controls on soft money, partial access to the media. Was it a, a defensible half a loaf in your view? Questionable. I think on some issues, on the soft money issue, for example, it was very good. It was very strong, um, and we would be an awful lot better off with that soft money provisions. And there were other things scattered in the bill that I think would have made a difference. But the question is, would it have stopped the enormous advantage that incumbents have or the, really the, the ability of special interest to pour lots of money into campaigns to buy their will to cash in on the legislative front? And, and that's where I thought the bill was really quite faulty. Um, the, you, you have to understand how the money breaks out right now. In House elections in the last, in 92, about 70% of the money came from a combination of PACs and large individual contributors. The House provisions would have actually reduced this only 4%. It would have been 66%. In my mind, that is not much of a change. For challengers, it actually would have increased the amount of this kind of money they could have taken. That is big money. 66% of the money in the political system as big money still remains, means to me that there are big problems with the system. Um, Brooks, do you think this Congress or any Congress in the, in the foreseeable future uh, is capable of enacting far-reaching reform? Well, it's happened in the past. Typically, the way it's happened, I'm thinking of 1913 when Congress uh, outlawed corporate money in, uh, in going into elections was uh, after years and years of pressure building up, uh, suddenly a behind-the-scenes deal would be struck and, and legislation would be passed unanimously. So uh, the pattern in the past has been years of debate and deadlock and uh, angst and uh, then suddenly uh, a non-controversial bill goes through. It seems to me the situation is different now and we're not likely to see that for two reasons. One is uh, that uh, everything's much, just much more public now. Uh, the other is that one of the principal hang-ups has been partisan self-interest. Uh, Democrats trying to protect their turf, uh, for example, House Democrats not wanting to give up that political action committee money. It's important to understand that half the money that pays for the re-election of Democratic House members on average comes from political action committees. They, they don't want to give that up. Um, Republicans, on the other hand, dislike spending limits and, uh, and just uh, will not agree to those um, because many of them believe that's the only way that they, as the party out of power, can, can get in because they think they, well, for a number of reasons. Uh, the Congress, by all uh, the experts' projections, is about to get more Republican and less Democratic. So uh, it seems to me that the opportunity, the moment was missed, in my opinion. And uh, nothing as ambitious as, we talk about the bill, actually there were two very separate bills that passed the Senate and the House and reconciling them was a huge problem. Uh, I personally do not see any opportunity for getting through anything as ambitious as either of those bills in the coming Congress. Well, here's a, a poll that uh, Ethel Klein, who's a public opinion pollster, did for, for us. And uh, one of the questions she asked was, uh, here are four issues, health care reform, campaign finance reform, the international trade agreement, and deficit reduction. Which do you think should be the highest priority? Uh, health care reform got 41%. Reducing the federal deficit got 48%. 
trade got 6%, and campaign finance reform came in at 3%. Uh, one percentage point above, don't know. Uh, this, is, this is very complicated stuff, and while the public is very angry at what it perceives to be political corruption, it's very angry at what it perceives to be uh, the mess inside the beltway, the more simple solutions, such as term limits uh, or um, constitutional amendment to balance the budget, that sort of thing, uh, these are bumper sticker solutions. Campaign finance reform is not a bumper sticker solution. How do you increase what, what political scientists or, or operatives would call the salience of this issue? How do, you, how do you market this and make the connection between the public's frustration and uh, a cleaner relationship between money and politics as, as the remedy? Well, part of that has to be, Bob, that somebody needs to speak out on the issue at the grassroots level and out in the, in the uh, country because I think we've had a kind of substitute for change in the term limitation movement. Even at best, that's going to only add to competition every 12 years, whereas real campaign finance reform would give challengers a much greater shot at unseating an incumbent every two years in the House and every six years in the Senate. In that sense, a term limitation is kind of a phony campaign finance reform. Uh, and I think a weak substitute for it. But nobody's made that case. Uh, lots of states have enacted term limitations. Others will do it this year. Uh, and in many ways, I think uh, uh, that's a telling comparison. But how do you build a grassroots movement behind something uh, as esoteric as this? Uh, Ellen? Well, I think, I think the, uh, the poll really sort of says it all. Um, the issue of money in politics is about health care. It is about telecommunications policy. It is about the budget. Um, it is the issue that provides a kind of wall against which anyone who wants to create policy changes, particularly in line with the public interest, has to surmount time and time again. In fact, the president was um, advised in several um, op-ed pieces in the major newspapers uh, to do, if he wanted to do, camp uh, to do health care reform, to do campaign finance reform first. And I think that that still remains to be good advice. It was, it has been uh, the wall of this money uh, coming from all kinds of interests that have blocked uh, a whole host of uh, issues, a, a, a slew of environmental issues, mining reform, super fund, clean water, all went down in the face of opposition of the moneyed interest. I think it is the fundamental issue, and I think activists are beginning to understand that, that if they care about health care, it's money and politics first. Fred? Well, if you ask people different questions related to the same subject, you'll get different answers. If you ask the public whether lobbyists in Washington have too much influence over government decisions, you'll get a very high percentage response. If you ask folks if money influences government decisions from interest groups and whether they think it comes at their expense, you're going to get very high responses. It's absolutely correct. When you talk about campaign finance reform, you're talking about an abstract comment and one that is not an emotional issue. Uh, uh, someone took the notion of acid rain. Those are very powerful words. Uh, this issue doesn't have that yet. And so it is a big challenge. And part of what has to be done is link up the anger that exists in the country correctly, in my view, by people that this government no longer belongs to them, that they want to reclaim their government, that they want representative democracy to represent them more and the power structure in Washington less. That has to be linked up with the solutions to that problem, bringing the undue influence of money uh, under control and uh, we're all going to have to do a better job of doing that if we're going to get uh, a greater, uh, a greater, a better answer to that question. Now, in California, of course, oh. yes, Mickey. I, I think it's my role to challenge a few assumptions. Please, please. Uh, you know, uh, n number one, you know, I, I disagree with Brooks that uh, uh, that the ch because of the changes that are going to take place in the Congress, that the chances for reform are diminished. I think the chances for reform, because the Republicans in the House, at least, uh, supported most of the provisions of this bill, the chances for reform are enhanced unless you define reform only as federal financing, which Republicans have a problem with. And I'm not sure, you know, Ellen, that, I, that I'm living in the same world. You, you keep talking about, you know, the tremendous impact of the wealthy. 
There's a $1,000 contribution limit uh, in it, from individuals. There's a $5,000 limit per PAC. Uh, you know, we're talking about the, the perpetuity of people in Congress. There's been an 84% turnover uh, in House seats in the last 16 years. My own home state of Oklahoma, starting in January, will have not one, will have only one member out of six who's been there longer than four years. I, mean, I think reform is possible. I think there are a lot of, I, what Joan was saying, a lot of the stuff that was in this bill was very, very good. And it seems to me that sometimes when, when people think of what, whatever they think the ideal is, it stands in the way of getting something that's almost the ideal. And I think to some extent, this hang up about we've got to have federal financing, which in my opinion, actually drives the system away from participation by individuals. Uh, I, the, the hang up with we've got to have federal financing, I think is what's hurting the chances of passing reform. And if we were to instead say, let's have a tax credit for $100, $200 uh, contributions. Let's require people to, to raise 50% or more of the money they spend on a campaign in their home district uh, for money raised in their home district. There are other ways to solve the problem other than having the federal government finance it. Okay. Mickey, I have to say, uh, would it only be that someone could give $1,000? I mean, we have seen huge bundles of money, upwards of $100,000 from employees of a single firm, in addition to $10,000 of PAC money. Would it be that a PAC could only give one contribution? In fact, the healthcare industry in 92 gave $33 million. It's very targeted money. PACs given PACs and individuals given PACs too. To say that there is a $1,000 limit and no more is really defying Perfect. how the money really works. Uh, Michael. Mike Walden. M Mickey Edwards may be able, may be able to explain why uh, matching funds for contributions is federal financing, but tax credits for the same contribution, which also uh, drains the treasury of the same amount is not federal financing, but I actually have a much broader. I'd be glad to answer that. Though. Well, I have a much broader disagreement on the issue of the partisan and bipartisan nature of this issue. Uh, you can look at all sorts of reasons why this didn't pass, and undoubtedly, my party had something to do with it. But the fact of the matter is, when push came to shove, as uncomfortable as any legislation like this is for incumbents, including Democratic incumbents, we were willing to bite the bullet and try and do it. And the Republicans filibustered this legislation to death in the Senate. And in the House, Newt Gingrich, who is running hard to try and be the Speaker of the House, it was reported last week in the Washington Post, told lobbyists and PAC managers in a secret meeting that uh, the Republicans had killed lobby reform and campaign finance reform because they were Stalinist and that the lobbyists should reward the Republicans by giving them the money and punish the Democrats by withholding the money. Uh, I, if this is the uh, reform ethos that uh, the uh, Republican members of the House are going to bring to this debate, it's very hard to see uh, how we can make the kind of progress that I hope we can make. I hope you're right that it's going to lead to progress, but I'm very skeptical based on the record. Trevor? I think it's also important to remember that we've been here before. Uh, we could have had this panel in 1973 and been talking about these same problems. We had the 74 Act, we've got the 1,000 dollar per contributor limit, and what we're seeing is what political scientists talk of as sort of the pop-up effect. The money that was banned in the thousand dollar contribution turns up in the bundled contributions, or the money that somebody doesn't want to report under the current system turns up just outside of it uh, as issue advocacy instead of electoral spending. And in that area, I, I think it's important to remember that if there is money out there and there are people who want to speak, one of the risks you run in creating a highly complex regulatory system that covers one area is that the money just turns up on the, the fringes. Is that fair, David? Well, that money turns up for incumbents, but it doesn't turn up for challengers. That's the problem. Incumbents have access to a wide range of money, especially political action committee money, and challengers face a substantial uphill battle just in reaching a point of visibility. Now, there's an alternative, and we're seeing it in several races around the country, and that is for self-financing for candidates who have deep enough pockets that they don't have to worry about raising money uh, from other people. They can simply fund their own campaigns. But for me, that poses a serious problem. Do we want a Congress that is largely self-financed, that, that have people in Congress who don't have to go out and ask people for their support in terms of contributions? And I think that uh, is a question we ought to be seriously thinking about. Doesn't, doesn't that backfire? I mean, you take a Michael Huffington who uh, has been called the Manchurian candidate 
uh, who is a substantially uh, a media creation, who's spending uh, something like uh, 20, 20 million dollars, a lot of it his own money. At some point, isn't the public smart enough to see through this? Well, yes, there are some of those that lose and some of those that win, but there's an increasing number of millionaire candidates in the United States Senate who have spent million dollars or more of their own money. And uh, folks like Rockefeller in West Virginia, uh, Romney here in Massachusetts, Huffington in California, Hyatt in Ohio, there's a whole set of them. Uh, in 1994, and it's a growing trend, not a declining trend. But you know, Bob, one of the problems is that, that the public says, well, at least they're not taking special interest money. And that's why public funding is so important. And I don't think that we've really dealt with that issue here, if we could just take a second to do that, which is that the concept in this legislation is that you will have a, a, a kind of public funding that will um, be a substitute for special interest money. If you look at how much the SNL bailout cost the taxpayer, billions and billions of dollars, and why did it happen? Because the banking committees in the Congress were really bought and sold by the banking interests, and they drained the federal treasury. Every single uh, contributor in the, uh, in, from the corporate side that goes into Congress and gives money, they're making an investment and they expect to get something for it. And they expect to get access, they expect to get tax breaks, they expect to get some return on their invested dollar. And so the only way that you can really compensate for that and have fair elections, it seems to me, is to put some public dollars behind that. Now there are different ways of putting it behind. What we originally started in the President's bill was to have the lobbyist fund the public funding, essentially to cut out the lobby deduction that businesses normally take. That got uh, taken away from us in another piece of legislation, uh, put into the economic bill, and so then the decision was made in the Congress to find funds that were not out of the U.S. Treasury, existing funds, but were funds that were for um, uh, different from different sources, such as uh, tax on um, uh, PACs and on um, and have a check off, a voluntary check off, uh, adding money to your tax return and so on. And so it really wasn't out of the federal treasury, but this kind of public money is at least clean and it allows competitive races without being indentured to the special interests. Brooks, you were going to jump in. I was basically going to make uh, <clears throat> Joan's point that the voters, frankly, uh, when given the choice between a, uh, a candidate who takes most of their money from special interest groups and a candidate such as uh, now Senator Herb Cole in Wisconsin who wrote checks for their own campaign. Senator Cole's uh, slogan was, I'm nobody's senator but yours. And uh, the voters, you said, see through it. Actually, they preferred the millionaire uh, in that case. It can't be And they bought. frequently do. Uh, <laughs> there, are about as, there are about as many millionaires who lose as there are who right. win, but, uh, but they have that, that advantage. The question ought to be, uh, is that are those the only two choices that the voters ought to have? <laughs> right. and um, could I, on this right, point, yeah. this system we have today cuts most people in this country out. And that, to me, is the starting point and, and the fundamental problem. It cuts most people out of, of running for office uh, in the sense that there are two ways you get elected to office now. You're either wealthy and you put up your own money, or you go to people who have a lot of money who want influence with you and you get the money from them. But in the larger sense, it cuts most people out because the principal players, in effect, winding, wind up taking care of themselves. The structure of Washington lobbyists, special interest PACs, wealthy individuals financing our government at the congressional level and now through loopholes back at the presidential level and in return, those people being first in line when, when it comes to decision making leaves most people in this country with this vision. You look at Washington and you see the lobbyists and the PACs, they're taking care of the members of Congress. The members of Congress appear to be taking care of the lobbyists and PACs and it leaves too many people saying, who's taking care of me? And this, in my view, is a central part of, of, a, of, an, of, 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 of people who now do not feel represented by our system. There's a lot of things that have to be done, but at the core of it, we have got to break through a system in which money does talk 
and which most people are left out. They, they're pushed to the back of the line when it comes to being represented in Washington. But, but you know, there are, there are, there are two distinct uh, ills here, it seems to me. One is the way politics and legislation get done in Congress, which is what you're talking about, Fred. The other ill is the way politics uh, gets done at a local election, where money is raised, the money goes to purchase television time. Uh, someone defined a political meeting in California as three people in front of a television set. <laughs> and what gets crowded out is what we think of as deliberative politics, people discussing issues, people meeting with a candidate. It's all done at one remove, and most of the candidate's energy goes into raising money, which more often than not is special interest money. But that affects the deliberative process in Congress, too. When you talk to Republican and Democratic leaders alike, they're, both they're all frustrated by trying to get Congress to focus on its legislative agenda. The task of fundraising has become a greater and greater preoccupation of members of Congress. Uh, the money chase goes on and on, and the Washington fundraisers and traveling back to the districts uh, to raise money becomes a constant preoccupation. And in the current system, where there are no limits, and where the specter of a wealthy candidate running against any incumbent haunts most of them, then they want to raise more and more and more money. They really don't know how much they need, and so they're in a perpetual uh, pursuit of money. Well, as the only practicing politician at the table, does, does this describe uh, your reality as a former member of Congress, Mickey? Uh, former practicing politician. <laughs> uh, well, actually, uh, I, I was thinking, uh, as Dave said that, but uh, I, I remember on most days, uh, my schedule card would include three, four, five, six different fundraisers going on that night for different uh, members of Congress uh, to go to. And I, you know, I, I completely agree that that's a problem. I, I agree that there's too much time. Uh, it's not nearly as much time as a lot of people think, but, uh, but there, there is too much time spent raising money. Uh, and, and I am concerned about you know, the impact of the special interest. You know, what I want us to do, though, is focus on other solutions uh, including the solution of empowering people through tax credits to increase participation by people and not putting in a system, for example, like limiting the amount of money in the system, uh, which reduces the possibility of a candidate being able to get his or her message out to the people. You know, we, we talked earlier in one of the sessions we had earlier uh, about uh, the availability of, of media time or other options to get the message out. So my quarrel is not with the problem as it's defined. My, my quarrel is really with the solutions, which I don't think get us to the kind of a system that we, we are going to like any better than what we have now. Let me push you a little bit on, on, on public financing. Someone made the point that incumbents have public financing. They have public financing through their congressional staffs. They have public financing through the use of the franc. They have public financing, in effect, through all the subsidies that incumbents get just by holding public office. So if incumbents have public financing. Why shouldn't challengers have public financing? Well, I, I do think it is important to find some way to make sure the challenger gets a, at least a minimum amount of exposure. So every challenger has a right to make sure that the public hears what that challenger's message is. Now, I, you know, I, you, you can carry the populist stuff just so far. I used to go to my town meetings in my district and say to my constituents, look, everybody's attacking the use of the franc. Do you want me to stop sending questionnaires and ask you what you think? Do you want me to stop sending you invitations to come meet with me in town meetings? Nobody wanted to do that. You know, so, so the, the fact is, uh, you, you can attack, because it sounds good, congressional staff. And you get rid of congressional staff. And then you don't have anybody researching issues or answering letters. And then everybody attacks members of Congress for not answering letters. So you know, the, the fact is, you know, if, if we can get away from that kind of, of, of attacks on the system and, and start looking at how can we give individual citizens a greater amount of control over who gets elected uh, and the resources they have to get elected, I think we'll be better off. But we have a remedy, and that's called public funding, Why which means good? that it, no, because it depends on who pays the bill. If the public pays the bill, then you work for them. If the corporate interests pay the bill, you work for them. It's pretty simple. Yeah, I was gonna make, I was gonna make it even simpler and say, say that's not very, the only two options. very simply, he who pays the piper calls the tune. And so the, the situation we now have is that principally corporate interests who outspend labor interests by factor of seven to one are clearly calling the tune. 
And, you know, if these are to be our elected representatives, then they must be beholden to us. It's a very simple but, principle. It was the Republican package in the, in the Congress that, that called for eliminating soft money, eliminating bundling, having a tax credit for individual contributions, reducing the PAC contribution limit to $2,000. That was all the Republican package. It wasn't the Democrat package. All those reforms you're talking about were the Republican package. The only hang up is that then we come back with, but I'm sorry, we want federal financing. And, and is there no other option? Is that, I mean, it, because that sort of cuts the debate pretty short. If it's not a discussion about how to reform the system, but just, my God, how can we get federal financing? You know, then that limits us quite a lot. The fact is the other element of this bill that Republicans have opposed as strongly as they have public financing is spending limits. Uh, they don't want spending limits because they want to be able to spend when they're challengers, especially if they're wealthy individuals, they want to be as, able to spend as much as they can. Uh, so, uh, in fact, if you look at the debates in Congress and the attitudes of the Republicans who've sought to block legislation, their opposition to spending limits is at least as significant a part of this uh, as their opposition to public funding. Uh, I, think, I think one thing to understand in all of this is that as important as campaign finance reform is, it, it can't be taken on its own. There's uh, a number of other things that make up what President Clinton has called the influence industry. 80,000 lobbyists, at least in Washington, D.C., working to try and block legislation or to pass legislation. The best calculus on health care uh, was that they spent more than $100, $100 million to block national health insurance. And it's the combination of the lobbying and the grassroots ads and the campaign financing all taken together that can have an enormous bottleneck effect so that when people look at Washington and they're all angry appropriately about why aren't things getting done, why does it take so long to get a crime bill, why can't we get national health care, with all the energy that's expended, these kind of issues are a very real part of it. And now both parties are looked at, and Republicans as well as the Democrats are trying to respond to this anger uh, and respond to the Perot phenomenon and the term limits phenomenon and say we're for change. But when push comes to shove, Democrats were willing to bite the bullet and be for public financing, which helps Republican challengers as well as Democratic challengers. Well, I'll give you half of that, Michael. Uh, it is true uh, that, uh, that uh, the Democrats, uh, particularly in the Senate under Senator uh, Majority Leader Mitchell's lead, uh, 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 have been supportive of the kinds of changes that at least we think are necessary. But it is also true that for whatever reasons, maybe there were other more important things, the president had an opportunity to move quickly on this legislation when he was enacted. The president recognized in his own comments that if he didn't get lobby reform or campaign finance reform, it would be much harder to get the other kinds of reforms. Uh, and the president did not do that. Uh, and the House Democrats, as Joan correctly pointed out, uh, took an issue that was supposed to come up early in 1993, did not act on it until November uh, of 1993, and didn't agree to a conference report until September of 1994. That's not a rush to change the system. I want to go back to Mickey's point about federal financing or public financing. Uh, I, I don't support it in the abstract. Uh, and it, it, the Pub, an individual's first response is, why should my money be used like this? With all the problems we have in this country, why should my tax dollars be used in this way? And my own feeling is, if we had any other way to do it that could solve the problems, I wouldn't be talking about it or supporting it. If we could figure out how to get disinterested money to incumbents and challengers, to challengers in a sufficient way so that they could run races, and to incumbents in a sufficient way that they weren't obligated to their private interest givers, we wouldn't need it, and I certainly, for me, wouldn't be talking about it. You, you, you come to it as a, as a solution because there doesn't appear to be another way to do, deal with two core problems. Challengers are starved in this system. No matter which party, they're starved, and incumbents have more than enough resources. And so if you want real elections, 
with challengers able to get their message out, we have to get resources to them. This appears to be the best way. Secondly, if we're going to get incumbent members off the narcotic of special interest money, easy money, you got to have a replacement. This is, appears to be the best way to do it, al along with things like reducing the cost of mailing and television, et cetera. But well, there's another point that I just want to make right. on public funding, because I think it is misunderstood. And that is that in this legislation that just failed, the total cost of <clears throat> the public funding was about one third of a B-1 bomber. I mean, we're not talking about a That's lot of money. It's big money, one third of a B-1 <laughs> Yeah, right, right. I mean, when you, talk five about years. It, when you talk about what does it take to try and, and reclaim your democracy, and I don't think that this bill did enough, but it was a heck of a good bill. And it, when you talk about that small amount of money um, it, it compared to all the other expenditures that we make, and if that would add a, a lot of faith back in the system, start getting challenges so that you could get uh, a people who are afraid now or don't have the resources or the capacity to, to run, you could get more women and minorities and other people who are, have been completely excluded from the system involved then I think that it, that is a very good investment of the U.S. Treasury and perhaps the best that will ever be made. Now, Brooks Jackson says that a, that a window of opportunity has been missed. Uh, we have a closely divided Congress that's probably going to be more closely divided after November 8th. Uh, what kind of bipartisan partial reforms uh, are thinkable next time, and uh, which of them would be worth having, if any? Ellen? Well, clearly the soft money problem has to be solved. I mean, th this is a, a system which threatens to overwhelm the, uh, uh, the functioning of the full public financing for the general election period. Yeah, give us an example of soft money. Soft money is limitless amounts of money, money that comes in um, usually $100,000 chunks from major corporate interest. I think the largest giver in the last election uh, was an agribusiness giant called ADM. They gave over a million dollars. They kind of divide it somewhat between, somewhat evenly between Republicans and Democrats, sort of hedge your bet kind of money, but lots of corporations do that. Who can, who can take soft money? Almost anybody can take soft money, but the national parties both created in about 1990 um, uh, accounts, basically, to, to take this money up and control uh, what turned out to be about $80 million of soft money, which was essentially unaccountable coming in uh, limitless, uh, limitless amounts of, um, of uh, sizes. Um, they would funnel the national parties, would then send it out to the state parties, and use it in ways to benefit uh, the, uh, the presidential ticket. This is money that's essentially prohibited from being in the electoral process. It is the biggest loophole in the law and threatens to overwhelm completely the presidential system. This has got to be stopped. Is, is there a bipartisan consensus for next time on, there, on there, there soft is, money? There is a fragmented bipartisan consensus. <laughs> the House Republicans have for some time uh, supported uh, closing down the soft money system. Uh, the Senate Democrats under George Mitchell have taken the lead in closing down the soft money system. Uh, when you get to the Senate Republicans and the House Democrats, you're in much more difficult territory. <laughs> Uh, President uh, Clinton ha has uh, st not only supported closing down the soft money system, but supported the kinds of comprehensive measures that are necessary to close it down. Uh, however, the President, uh, uh, along with others, will face an acid test because one effort in the next Congress clearly is going to focus on taking that piece of the bill that dealt with soft money and getting it passed in time to protect the integrity of the 1996 presidential election. You may well be able to do it if President Clinton is willing to do it uh, and if this issue is pushed hard in the House. But this is a very interesting example of where the notion that these are simply partisan differences doesn't really play out in reality. And needless to say, both national parties uh, do not want to see this system shut down. I, I think there's a real chance to do it, uh, but we will need President Clinton to really take the lead on it, uh, and we'll have to go very early with this, with this change. I would think that the other possible area for bipartisan progress uh, is in the area of media, where the current problem is that a candidate to be competitive has to raise a ton of money, much of it from special interests, 
to then throw at television uh, to make negative ads. The, the opposition then makes his or her own negative ads. The public then concludes that both of them are right. They're both scoundrels. And uh, I would think that because the broadcasters have been gouging the candidates for so long, that there would be a nice uh, bipartisan consensus on the need for cheap money, a cheap uh, TV time, you, rather. You would think that, but yeah, I but, would. But it's, but it's not just TV. I mean, let me tell you, having raised the money, it, it's, it's TV, it's radio, it's newspapers, it's printing, it's postage, it's, you know, it, it's the, the, the cost of running. Nobody likes raising money. The, but the cost of, of running a campaign uh, is outrageous. And uh, you know, that is one way to start attacking it. You, you, you can go on about your point about broadcast, but it's not just broadcast. It, it's, you know, candidates get gouged in a way that really makes it very difficult for them to get their message effectively to the voters. But is any kind of reform on that front, given what we expect the new Congress to be uh, in the cards? Brooks, do you see it? I don't talk to uh, members and they don't bear their souls to me quite to the extent uh, uh, Fred Wertheimer and Ellen and Joan have done, but my impression <laughs> is that there is a fairly wide agreement on both sides of the partisan aisle that uh, requiring broadcasters to sell them <laughs> the incumbents cheap radio and TV time. And the challengers. Uh, and the challengers too. That, that, that's a pretty easy thing to do and the idea that the uh, broadcast lobby is going to wait in there and, and stop that is uh, exaggerated. Actually, uh, the broadcast lobby is, uh, uh, as you pointed out, in, uh, held in kind of low repute by a lot of incumbents who feel that, that they have been overcharged for years and this might be a good way to get even with them. <laughs> Bob, if I could just add one thing. It's, it's absolutely the case that one thing that President Clinton and Bob Dole and Ross Perot agree on is that they've all called for free TV time or reduced t cost TV time for candidates. Uh, there are obstacles and one of the obstacles is uh, the uh, changing attitude of the courts toward this kind of regulation of broadcasting based on it, at least in part on a lawsuit brought by Ted Turner uh, and uh, uh, Brooks's uh, boss's boss, at least. Uh, so it's, it's far from an easy issue, but it's certainly something where there could be a consensus. And again, this was something that the legislation that was just filibustered to death had in it. In the Senate, instead of public financing, it was a 50% discount on broadcast time for candidates who comply with spending limits. In effect, the kind of free TV. Well, let me just take one exception to the easy broad consensus here. The Senate bill did have uh, this provision for cutting uh, uh, the cost of television in half, but it was tied to spending limits. Uh, so that there was a trade-off here. You would limit the amount of money you're spending in return for getting cheaper television. And there is a question about what happens if you just give cheaper television and let the money keep flowing. On the House side, however, that provision wasn't in the bill. And that was because, among other things, the Democratic chairman of the Committee of Jurisdiction, Chairman John Dingell, uh, at least for the last couple of Congresses hasn't been all that interested at all in this concept. So here again, you don't necessarily have partisan differences, but you have uh, uh, people of the same party necessarily taking different points of view. That would be, have to be overcome as part of this. Well, while we have, uh, yes. I, just before Make that, I, I don't want a point that Dave made to, to get lost here. You, you can debate whether public financing uh, is, uh, good or bad, and, and whether people would prefer to have a millionaire uh, buying his or her own election uh, rather than taking money from special interests. But I don't think we should just ignore the problem we have with the number of wealthy people who are buying their way into public office. I think this is a real serious problem. Somebody mentioned Romney. It's not Romney. It's Romney. It's Kennedy. It's Weld. It's Roosevelt. I mean, you know, it, it's throughout the country. Uh, increasingly the number of people who serve in public office are people who are disconnected financially from the people they seek to represent. And I think that is a very serious problem that we're going to have to find a way to deal with. We have constitutional problems with it, I know. Uh, but I don't think we want to reach a point where, where we have a country where all of us sit here while the millionaires decide what we should do. Well, and there's another problem that's related, and that's the problem of independent expenditures. And in, in an era of issue advocacy like we've seen with both guns and health care, uh, incumbents and challengers have to worry about groups coming into their states or their districts and spending a very large amount of money in an independent expenditure, which again unsettles the system and causes candidates who have access to money or can raise money to decide they really need to raise a lot of money. 
They really should never close down. In the old days, the United States Senate used to only gear up for fundraising in the last two years of a six-year cycle. Now freshman senators are advised to never close down their fundraising operation. They have to anticipate a well-funded candidate or a big independent expenditure coming at them. And that only leads more and more to this preoccupation with money, raising money, spending money, never really closing down your fundraising operation. Well, you know, the, uh, this bill did address both the issues of millionaires and independent expenditures. The problem, of course, is that the First Amendment right to free speech makes it very difficult to control these by absolute bans. Right. And so what this bill did, once again, it used public money as a solution, uh, which would, uh, for the millionaire who refused to abide by the limits, or if there's an independent expenditure, the participating candidate would get compensating funds, not the full amount being spent against them, but compensating funds to help them keep pace. And that then is a deterrent in a way for those outside expenditures or those millionaires to come in um, and, and overwhelm the system. And I do agree with Mickey. I think that this issue of the, the, the millionaires is part of what's happening here is where it's turning into the political parties in many ways are turning into Tweedledum and Tweedledee. Um, the, the, the political, cor the corporations and the political PACs and the special interest money treat them like Tweedledum and Tweedledee. Then you have millionaires for whom the, the party differences are less and eventually you really don't have anyone represented in Congress except the wealthy. All right, let me put some facts on that if I can. There are 28 out of the 100 Senate members currently who are millionaires and more on their way. In fact, there's a 155% increase in self-financed candidates in this current election cycle. So this is a very disturbing trend, and who knows how many of them will win. It may not buy the election, and we've seen that self-financed candidates don't always buy the election, but it does always buy them political viability. They do get recognition well beyond, perhaps, their own abilities through their money. The, the irony here, though, is that this is something of an unintended consequence of the 74 reforms, because you put in a $1,000 per person contribution limit, and then the court said, but you can't apply it to independent expenditures or individuals spending their own money. So everybody else has this limit, except in those two circumstances. And I think that's the sort of thing, when you look at all these candidates spending their own money, as Mickey was pointing out, if you're a challenger and you say, I'm not getting PAC money, uh, the party has a relatively small limit of what they can spend on my house race. Uh, everyone else has a $1,000 limit on what they can give to me. Where am I going to find it? You turn them, you find them turning around and, and looking in their own checkbook. Yeah, well, let me, just, let me just follow up on your point, Trevor. I think there were a lot of unintended consequences of the 74 laws, but some of the results of those laws have given us things that had we been wiser, we could have predicted. And that is, a, a, I think, a caution for us today as we move forward. Um, the law in restricting special interest contributions actually sanctioned a system in which some people could give $1,000. If you were wealthy, you could give $1,000. But that's such a high level for average Americans that very few people can unless you are of an interested giver type of class. And I think it also, in some ways, um, sanctioned a system of corporate giving, which had been outlawed since 1943. Now we say you can give through PACs. They created these envelopes. So the unintended consequences, I think, are substantial of the 70s reforms. And we have to be cautious. We are smarter. We are wiser now when we design the next set of reforms. I just have to challenge that. Uh, let, me, let me just Fred, challenge that right, analysis. Oh, Fred, Michael, David, and then let's throw it open to the audience. Uh, uh, the unintended consequences comes from the Supreme Court's decision of Buckley v. Vallejo. We had wealthy candidates spending huge amounts of money prior to the 1974 law uh, with, despite the fact that contributions were unlimited, they had a huge advantage. Uh, and what the 1974 law tried to do was limit personal wealth, and the Supreme Court said no. Uh, the fact that the Supreme Court said no doesn't lead me to conclude we'd be much better off if every individual in America could give a million dollars to a candidate running for office so they could compete with a wealthy person. PACs existed long before the 1974 law, uh, and they, were, uh, uh, they have been around since the 50s. What the 1974 law did was limit political action committee contributions and limit individual contributions. Uh, and Frankly, the 1974 law was two laws. 
One law was the presidential system. It created a presidential public financing system. Uh, those of us who worked in it at the time thought it was a good reform. I still think it's a good reform. Thought it was a victory for reform. The 1974 law created a private system for congressional races. Public financing was defeated in 1974. That was viewed by people working on it as a loss for reform. And it was the defeat of the public financing provisions, in my view, that opened the door to all of this. Not that a reform was passed that just didn't work out correctly, but that a critical element of that reform was rejected back then, and it just opened the door to everything that happened since then. Michael? It's very important, as, as strong a supporter as I am of campaign reform, it's very important that whatever we do, we do not make the error of simply limiting the amount that people can give or simply limiting the amount of money that's in the system so much that it puts a damper on political participation. Soft money is something that we've talked about and we are committed, the president is committed uh, to closing that loophole. The fact is soft money, uh, the problem with soft money is not how it's spent but where it comes from. Soft money is among the only money in the system that goes for grassroots activity, volunteer activities, get out the vote drives, voter registration. Uh, and it, you, if you worked in a campaign, you know that the consultants uh, who so frequently dominate campaigns will throw every nickel that they can get their hands on onto television ads. And so that uh, the problems that we all see of declining participation, declining interest in politics, uh, declining participation by actual people as opposed to paid canvassers or paid, uh, paid petition gatherers uh, is something that we have to be very careful not to worsen with reform. Our soft money proposal, which does shut down the soft money system, nonetheless retains an ample amount of money, what's called hard money or illegal, federally regulated money, specifically earmarked for those kinds of grassroots activities. And whatever we do needs to make sure that we don't simply turn everybody into uh, a nation of uh, TV ad watchers. The point is not that we uh, spend too much money on politics. I think it's arguable that we don't spend too much. We might spend more productively. It's the distribution of how that money is spent. And the problem, of course, with that is that there are some interests, specifically PACs, that give so heavily to incumbents that they really tilt the system. One reform that might be worth thinking about would be to index contributions for inflation and to raise the level of individual contributions and party contributions because both individuals and parties tend to give to challengers much, much more than PACs do. The other thing I would say is that I think this illustrates the importance of comprehensive reform because you can't just deal with one segment of the problem. When you do that, the money tends to pop up somewhere else. And what you really need to do is identify and anticipate uh, the unintended consequences uh, in the reform activity so that you can map out and try and plan how the whole system is going to work once you change it. Otherwise, all you do is have the appearance of reform without really changing anything. Microphone one. Dan Buffet, and I'm a master's student here at the Kennedy School. Uh, you talk a lot about the problem of uh, the influence of PACs and uh, lobby groups and special interests. I have a simple question, that is, who are these interests and what's so special about them? <laughs> who who they? Uh, I'll answer that. John? Um, the uh, special interests are uh, the uh, oil industry, the chemical industry, the tobacco industry, uh, uh, the auto industry, every industry in America that wants a piece of the treasury. And what they're looking for are tax breaks and uh, regulatory limits and all sorts of things that they view as costing money, or in the case of the banking industry, they wanted the, um, to be able to uh, rob the SNLs and have the taxpayer pay for the bailout. So those are the, those are the interests that, that are coming forward and, um, and lobbying the Congress, and they do it in a number of different ways. One is campaign contributions, other they form front groups to do grassroots campaigns that look like there's public support for what they're doing. Uh, they do it through public relations campaigns, as in the health care bill. Uh, um, and uh, they do it through schmoozing with members of Congress and taking them on trips to um, charity events that are really just places to schmooze and get to see them for you know, 48 or 72 hours. Or um, they invite them to make speeches and, and keep them for dinner. Or they take them to the football games and the opera and all the rest. I mean, these are out to dinner every other night. Can I, can I add to that? It's also organized labor, common cause, public citizen. <laughs> you know, it's, it's a lot of other people, too. I, uh, wish, and, I wish we had the money to do uh, that. And, and, and I would add one other thing, and, and Dan, because, because I think this is a real concern. Mm -hmm. 
I, I think it is important to not let that get out of hand, but where they're coming from, what is special, is that the First Amendment to the Constitution says that, that citizens have a right to petition their government. Uh, and citizens who are concerned that legislation being considered by any legislative body uh, might affect their livelihood have a right under the Constitution to try to affect the outcome of that. Uh, but and the I, problem I is that only, only, if, only if you have millions of dollars are no. you considered I, a citizen I, under that no, definition. No, Mickey, I, don't think right? so. I totally agree with you on right. the right to petition. I totally agree with you. You can define us any way you want or any other. There, we, there are lots of interest groups in our society. No one's going to change that. But there is this basic question of turning over large sums of money to you in order to exercise that right to petition. I, the Constitution does not protect I that. Agree with Buckley that. I says agree that, that amount can be limited. We don't give campaign contributions. We try to influence the process. It's going to take place. There is something special, I believe, and that's what Buckley recognizes, about providing substantial sums of money to people who are in public office at the same time you're trying to influence them. That is different, and that's what this is about. You've never thought of having a common cause PAC? No. Yes. Uh, my name is Matthew Batinsky, and I'm a master's student in the School of Education. And I'd like to ask a question about the phenomena of individuals donating um, in areas outside of where they live. For instance, someone in California donating to a congressional election in New York State. I guess I'd like to understand what are the principles that allow that to happen, um, you know, philosophically and practically, and the legislation that's being considered, how does it handle that, and is that something that's being looked into to limit? Because I just don't understand why someone who lives in California should be able to donate money and in that sense influence the democrat democratic process and self-determination of residents of New York, in my example. David? Well, the answer is we've never regulated that, uh, and so people have done that, and you're exactly right. There's a lot of that that happens, uh, especially in states in my part of the country, Wyoming, Utah, Colorado, Nevada, a lot of out-of-state money. In fact, many incumbent senators raise 90% or more of their individual contributions above $500 from out-of-state in fundraisers in Scottsdale or Beverly Hills or Manhattan. So it is a major issue, especially incumbents, and their various fundraising meccas in America where you go to get the large individual contributions. Uh, and so you've identified an important problem. Others on the panel can speak to whether this spe uh, specific legislation did anything to address that. The, the Republican campaign reform bill, which was introduced, uh, doesn't totally eliminate it. But it does require, as I said before, that, that at least 50% of the money you raise has to come from within your own district. Well, what are the democratic principles that would even allow that to happen? Is there someone philosophically rationalizing this as good for America, influencing national policy, whatever it may be. Bob, I'll talk. You want, go ahead, Fred, and I'll come. Well, I was, I was going to say that there's several different issues here that add complexity to your question, and it's not, uh, uh, it's, there, there are arguments on both sides. One issue is that there, there are some members of Congress who are chairman of committees and subcommittees that they deal with national legislation, and they really have two constituencies. One is the constituency of voters in their district whom they represent, and the other is the national decision-making process for which they're in charge of. And so um, th that is one reason why, um, on the negative side, people who um, are not in their district want to give them money because they want to influence them. But also, it's an argument that they are, in many ways, a national political figure as well as a state political figure. The other issue, which is a, a more serious one from a democratic point of view, uh, in my estimation, is that there are, um, in, when you, if you want to have uh, uh, campaigns where both candidates are really competitive, uh, if you are a Republican, the argument is that you can get money from the car dealers and the bankers and uh, all of the local businessmen because they believe your philosophy is Republican. And if you're a Democratic challenger, particularly if you're a minority or a woman, it's very difficult to raise money. And, and so um, that the labor unions, for example, have been one of the major ones that have helped challengers. And some uh, liberal larger donors in other states have helped challengers. And I think a lot of this has happened in the absence of public funding because there is no base funding for uh, low income or lower income or not rich uh, candidates. Well, I, I 
I think there's a growing saliency to this issue. There's, there, I believe there is growing concern in communities and states about why so much of uh, the money that their elected representatives get is coming from constituencies that are not electing that person. I mean, there is the question here of, of the balance and the question of whether an elected representative is representing their constituency. And in doing that, you can have a broader perspective or whether they're representing their contributors. And to the extent the contributors more and more come from outside the constituencies, you have a real clash there. I think there are constitutional problems in attempting to flatly restrict money geographically to a local constituency. Uh, there are ways you could do it as part of a voluntary system if you chose to. There is a problem under the current system in that kind of restriction because incumbents get all the money and challengers don't. And if you had a very tight in-district restriction, you might really make it even much harder for challengers to get any money than they have now. But if you had a broader system, uh, I think that issue is going to attract more and more uh, attention from the public. There's an important reason why contributors do this, though, and it's a very good question, and that is you get more bang for your buck in some states than you do in others. The cost of advertising, the cost of running in North Dakota don't compare at all with New York or California. So if you're an intelligent investor, if you look at political money as an investment, you're going to go to South Dakota. And South Dakota has been recently setting the record for out-of-state contributions because the advertising market is much cheaper. And in terms of the party control of the US Senate that has been up for grabs for much of the last decade, it makes a big difference who wins in South Dakota, North Dakota, and Idaho. And you could get a lot more for your money in those states. So, yes. Hello, my name is John <laughs> Simon. I'm a master's student here at the Kennedy School as well. Um, there's been a lot of talk about spending limits among this panel. And I'm just wondering if an unintended consequence of a spending limit would be to further entrench incumbents since an incumbent already has name recognition, an incumbent has a franking, franking privilege, if, there, if a, an incumbent and a challenger had to spend the exact same amount of money, would not a uh, challenger be disadvantaged because the incumbent has all the other avenues of uh, advertisement that are not available to a challenger? You know, Brooks? In, in, in theory, absolutely right. If you were, for example, to set the spending limit at zero, uh, the, there would be no campaign and the incumbent would win because the challenger wouldn't be able to mount a campaign. Um, the, uh, the trick then became, be, becomes to set spending limits at a level that uh, doesn't inhibit competition. And the argument can be made that uh, if set at the proper level, and it's going to be, it may be arguably different for each congressional district, certainly different for each state, uh, you might. Uh, be able to enhance competition if you uh, give potential challengers the idea that the uh, incumbent is not going to be able to raise uh, a jillion dollars and blow them away, that a challenge becomes economically viable, that the limit is something that they can aspire to. Uh, and David has been one of the ones who's argued this point, I think. It only works if you're going to infuse money into the system. There are many ways to infuse money. Mickey's spoken of some, there are others. But without infusing money into the hands of challenger spending limits make no sense to me. There's another factor too, John, that is in a campaign, um, it isn't necessary to have more money than the other candidate. It's necessary to have enough money to be able to get your message out. Uh, once you have reached that threshold, the other guy may outspend you three to one, but, but if you have enough money to get your message out, you can probably you know, have a good chance to win. and that's. Uh, I think been demonstrated a number of times by candidates. The, the other facet of this is that it's possible uh, for a campaign to have too much money, witness the California Senate race, where the additional millions and tens of millions of dollars uh, don't go to educate the public, they don't go to increase volunteer efforts, uh, they just go to throw mud at each other, and at some point the public just throws up their hands and says a plague on both their houses. But the amount of money that, w that was in, that was the limit in the bill that just uh, failed uh, was way above what the vast majority of challengers ever raised, far above. It was uh, $600,000 plus a few additional uh, uh, provisions to uh, allow it to grow a little bit. But uh, the, uh, most of the challengers never exceeded $300,000. Michael, so, and then let's go to the, the floor best, again. 
example, the best real world example of how spending limits and public financing do not entrench incumbents but help uh, increase competition comes in the presidential system where since the, uh, since the system was put into place, uh, challenger Jimmy Carter, challenger Ronald Reagan, uh, challenger uh, Bill Clinton have been elected and it's very hard to find a congressional seat where you have that kind of rate of, uh, of turnover with challengers beating incumbents. The same with the New York mayoralty and other places where there are spending limits in public finance. Uh, Trevor, quick there's, comment. There's a practical element to this, and I'm glad Michael re mentioned the presidential ones, because one of the things from an administrative point of view, though, is that the presidential uh, races, and in particular their spending limits, have proved very difficult to administer, because you have lots of arguments about what counts against the limit, what's in, what's out, what's spent, whether you're over the limit or not. And the moment the Federal Election Commission takes a couple of years for these presidential campaigns to fully audit them and determine whether they went over the limit or not, uh, we're, if we go a spending limit approach, you're going to have to find a way to simplify that because you can't are imagine most, doing the presidential are most system. most of those problems in the state-by-state state limits, which this bill would have repealed? A lot of them are, but you also run into the actual caps, you know, what they're spending in the primaries, uh, did they go over the primary limit? Now granted there, you're dealing with a primary and a general, and I don't know whether the legislation would have had different limits for both, but as soon as you have a variety of limits, uh, or the possibility of spending outside of those limits and the questions to whether it should apply or not, you run into a, a uh, I think, a, a fairly complicated system. Hi, my name is David Gartner. I'm, I have a question for Mr. Waldman and anyone else who'd want to comment. I'm curious to know how much soft money on this whole question of soft money President Clinton has raised, um, how that compares with his predecessors, and why, given this stated commitment to ending the use of soft money, he didn't use that same time to go and campaign publicly for campaign finance reform. President Clinton has raised a significant amount of soft money. Uh, he has raised, uh, he raised it during the first two years of his term. Uh, the reason he's continued to raise it is, uh, very simply, we do not believe in unilateral disarmament. Uh, if we are going to be not raising it while the Republicans who are trying to kill health care, kill the crime bill, and kill everything else we're doing, uh, continue to raise it, then uh, we would be putting ourselves in a dis disadvantageous position that doesn't make any sense. The test, we've always argued, is are you for ending soft money, are you for campaign finance reform or not? We hope that we would be able to pass campaign finance reform in the first two years. As I said, we're very disappointed that it didn't happen. We're going to keep working on it, and we certainly continue to support the elimination of soft money, and I have no doubt that it's going to apply to President Clinton and his re-election. Yeah. Could I find out the number, though? I'm sorry, just how many million he's raised? Because uh, I'm not sure. That's I, don't, I, I don't actually yeah. know, but I think it was 40 million. Or 40, 40, million 40 million from July 92 through July 90, okay. through June 94. Thanks. Yes. Hi, my name is Matt Anessis. I'm a senior at the college, and I'm chair of the Student Advisory Committee at the Institute of Politics. Um, I was wondering if I could test the optimism or pessimism of the panel uh, and ask you to look into your crystal balls. Uh, and regardless of whether or not, wh regardless of what you want, what do you believe will be the situation with campaign finance 10 or 15 years down the line? John? Uh, I think that the uh, public mood is uh, so angry that no matter what happens in this election, uh, we are going to have. Um, public uh, financing of elections uh, within that period of time, and I believe much, much sooner. I think that we're going to have it uh, come incrementally, uh, that we're going to have partial public financing first, and uh, that when the um, opponents of public financing are faced with the choice of either having to take some or opt out, they're going to take it, and then they're going to be uh, stopped from opposing it in the future. And I think that that is perhaps the only way that we're going to get it. This has to come through grassroots uh, uh, demand as well as through leadership at the national level. And it can happen both at the state level, which it's already happening at, as well as at the national level. And uh, so I see this as a combination event. Uh, the, uh, the speed with which it occurs, I think, will depend in part on leadership in the Congress and the, and the White House and on the strategic ability of the uh, citizens of this country and their willingness to fund and put time and energy into it. A couple of other quick uh, comments on well, that. Well, Matt, I see significant reform. I, I don't think we'll have federal financing. I just don't think that's <laughs> going to happen. Uh, but I think most of the other reforms that we have talked about tonight will happen. 
uh, including probably some uh, cap on spending, some, some spending limit. It won't be a, a low level, but uh, somewhere. And uh, I think almost everything else will happen. Well, if I could just add, I think we'll have fundamental reform, uh, but I also think 10 or 15 years from now, we'll be looking at a whole new set of issues of how to deal with the power of money over political decisions that are going to come out of the, uh, the information revolution that is going on today. We will have a whole, a large range of issues, none of which have been touched on today. My prediction is that Congress will pass comprehensive reform in the year 2000. President Huffington will veto it. <laughs> and then in 2004, we'll eliminate the middleman and have auctions of Senate and House. Uh, Bob, 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 Mr. Huffington or Mrs. Huffington? <laughs> uh, just a couple uh, quick uh, observations for the comment of anyone who would care to. Uh, it's, it's, of course, uh, Clinton isn't alone in this, but uh, I think it's noteworthy that uh, his favorite golf partner, Vernon Jordan, is uh, quite an expert at some of the techniques that people have been describing. Ron Brown uh, is another, and I'm sure there are others who could be mentioned. Um, I just want to say, uh, give a nod to Jerry Brown, who uh, was the notably one of the few rec in recent memory who's actually tried to put any of this into practice by uh, self-imposed $100 uh, per, per person campaign limit. and. Uh, whatever else anybody might feel about every aspect of the campaign and, and his program, uh, he actually was successful in defeating Clinton uh, in, in, the, in the Connecticut primary. So it's not impossible, although of course it's better to have some money when your opponents have a lot of money. When he tried to put his 800 number out, it was Tom Brokaw who tried to shut him up, interestingly. Uh, but I think if, if we the people, whoever we are, choose to, we can support the candidates we, we want to support no matter how much money some of the other people may be getting. And I think we need to begin to do that. We, we need to begin to demand that of candidates, that they make it a priority and support only those who do. As far as the specifics that have been addressed by the panel, we, have, uh, one, we once had an idea of the public airwaves and I think that's being lost in this, in this phase of privatization of the radio spectrum and all that. But as far as I know, they're still public. And why can't we demand, not reduced cost, but free airtime, like they have, I think, in, in England, free airtime for candidates. And by the way, not just for Republicans and Democrats. I have, you know, I mean, let's not just assume that this is just going to be, f because I think if you want public support, I think the skept there's skepticism that this is just going to be for the same old uh, two-headed monster in Washington, that it has to be expanded to include, there has to be ballot access reform, and there has to be an opportunity for other uh, uh, forms of uh, political perspective to be part of this effort, of this, of this political tussle. Thank you. Let's take one more question or comment. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, my name is Avery Gardner. I'm a sophomore at Harvard Radcliffe and a member of the, stu the Student Advisory Committee at the Institute of Politics. I'd like to ask you about the roads to reform. We've heard a lot about the different kinds of reforms and the situation and the problems. Uh, but given that Congress itself is the very institution which is supposed to be regulating its own campaigns, there's obviously a fundamental conflict there, uh, that the incumbents don't want to change the system and don't want to put themselves at a disadvantage in the electoral process. We have seen, however, initiatives at the state level, I think of the Florida gubernatorial election, uh, which is now uh, partially publicly financed, as well as the Kentucky elections. And beyond that, there are some legal initiatives that are being filed in California, New York, and some other states. I wonder if the panel could, con could comment briefly on some of the non-federal level um, opportunities for campaign finance reform legislation and change. Ellen? Um, let me say that a, that a number of states have experimenting in a number of new ways. There has been a lot of work going on in this arena uh, for a long time. Um, but now we see states like Maine or Missouri or New Mexico considering really different kinds of paradigms. In fact, you know, systems of total public financing. I think that's very exciting work. We see $100 initiatives appearing on ballots in other states around the country. And of course, there are many efforts, some of which have been quite successful, in the arena of partial public financing, mirroring some of the attempts that have been made uh, at, the, at the national level. 
So I think the states are really the laboratory for reform. And I think we might find some new ways that work that ultimately reflect back to Washington and show Washington legislators how we really ought to do campaign finance reform. Okay, one quick last question. Thank you. Uh, my name is Jason Cohen, and uh, I work with the National Voting Rights Institute here in Cambridge. Uh, first of all, I, uh, I guess I, I'd like to say I'm a little bit disappointed that there hasn't been more attention paid to the constitutional aspect of this question beyond a simply mentioning of, uh, of Buckley Vallejo. Uh, my question is this, rather than asking how constitutional term, or excuse me, spending limits are, shouldn't we be perhaps asking how constitutional a system is that pretty much methodically deprives individuals without wealth of their right to representational democracy in this country? And when I'm talking about this, actually, I'm specifically referencing the, uh, the case brought on behalf of Sal Albanese in the 13th Congressional District of New York uh, by the National Voting Rights Institute. Well, you raise a, a great subject for a whole other panel. Let, let me just say you've got two rather contending uh, constructions of the Constitution here, one of which would be built on the Equal Protection Clause, arguing that what some have called the wealth primary, uh, the requirement that you pass a certain threshold of wealth uh, before your candidacy can be taken seriously, uh, is possibly uh, of questionable constitutional merit under one doctrine, whereas the First Amendment absolutists would say that uh, the right to petition, the right to vote, the right to give uh, $100,000 of soft money uh, are all constitutionally protected. And uh, perhaps we'll see these different constitutional doctrines in contention as more of these lawsuits are, are mounted. Uh, with that, let me thank uh, the Institute of Politics, the uh, Kennedy School Forum, the American Prospect Magazine uh, as co-sponsors of this and uh, our panel and our audience. Thank you very much. An hour and a half on this subject stretches, stretches. <laughs> well, did you get a signal to cut us off? Not yet. Brown. I was supposed to go right at 9.30. Good timing. Oh, God. Well, that was about as lively as you can do this subject, <laughs> which is not very easy. You can Without Mitch McConnell on your yeah. yeah, well, that's not a concern. There, there are undoubtedly ways to design it so that you can deal with limits without ending up in the presidential system. But you know that people are going to try to game it. Oh, God. And, uh, you, know, you, can't, you can't run it.